Chapter Five, Part One of An Essay on the Trial by Jury. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Beth Ann. Trial by Jury by Lysander Spooner. Chapter Five, Part One. Objections Answered. The following objections will be made to the doctrines and the evidence presented in the preceding chapters. First, that it is a maxim of the law that the judges respond to the question of law, and juries only to the question of fact. The answer to this objection is that, since Magna Carta, judges have had more than six centuries in which to invent and promulgate pretended maxims to suit themselves and this is one of them. Instead of expressing the law, it expresses nothing but the ambitions and lawless will of the judges themselves, and of those whose instruments they are. Note. Judges do not even live up to that part of their own maxim, which requires jurors to try the matter of fact. By dictating to them the laws of evidence, that is, by dictating what evidence they may hear, and what they may not hear, and also by dictating to them rules for weighing such evidence as they permit them to hear. They, of necessity, dictate the conclusion to which they shall arrive. And thus the court really tries the question of fact, as well as the question of law, in every cause. It is clearly impossible, in the nature of things, for a jury to try a question of fact, without trying every question of law on which the fact depends. End footnote. Second, it will be asked, of what use are the justices, if the jurors judge both of law and fact? The answer is that they are of use. 1. To assist and enlighten the jurors, if they can, by their advice and information. Such advice and information to be received only for what they may chance to be worth in the estimation of the jurors. 2. To do anything that may be necessary in regard to granting appeals and new trials. Third, it is said that it would be absurd that twelve ignorant men should have power to judge of the law, while justices learned in the law should be compelled to sit by and see the law decided erroneously. One answer to this objection is that the powers of juries are not granted to them on the supposition that they know the law better than the justices but on the ground that the justices are untrustworthy, that they are exposed to bribes, and are themselves fond of power and authority, and are also the dependent and subservient creatures of the legislature, and that to allow them to dictate the law would not only expose the rights of parties to be sold for money, but would be equivalent to surrendering all the property, liberty, and rights of the people unreservedly into the hands of arbitrary power. The legislature to be disposed of at its pleasure. The powers of juries, therefore, not only place a curb upon the powers of legislators and judges, but imply also an imputation upon their integrity and trustworthiness, and these are the reasons why legislators and judges have formerly entertained the intensest hatred of juries, and, so fast as they could do it without alarming the people for their liberties, have, by indirection, denied, undermined, and practically destroyed their power. And it is only since all the real power of juries has been destroyed, and they have become mere tools in the hands of legislators and judges, that they have become favorites with them. Legislators and judges are necessarily exposed to all the temptations of money, fame, and power to induce them to disregard justice between parties, and sell the rights and violate the liberties of the people. Jurors, on the other hand, are exposed to none of these temptations. They are not liable to bribery, for they are unknown to the parties until they come into the jury box. They can rarely gain either fame, power, or money by giving erroneous decisions. Their offices are temporary, and they know that when they shall have executed them, they must return to the people to hold all their own rights in life subject to the liability of such judgments, by their successors, as they themselves have given an example for. The laws of human nature do not permit the supposition that twelve men, taken by lot from the mass of the people, and acting under such circumstances, 
will all prove dishonest. It is a supposable case that they may not be sufficiently enlightened to know and do their whole duty, in all cases whatsoever, but that they should all prove dishonest is not within the range of probability. A jury, therefore, ensures to us what no other court does, that first an indispensable requisite in a judicial tribunal, integrity. Fourth, it is alleged that if juries are allowed to judge of the law, they decide the law absolutely, that their decision must necessarily stand, be it right or wrong, and that this power of absolute decision would be dangerous in their hands by reason of their ignorance of the law. One answer is that this power which juries have of judging of the law is not a power of absolute decision in all cases. For example, it is a power to declare imperatively that a man's property, liberty, or life shall not be taken from him, but it is not a power to declare imperatively that they shall be taken from him. Magna Carta does not provide that the judgments of the peers shall be executed, but only that no other than their judgments shall ever be executed, so far as to take a party's goods, rights, or person thereon. A judgment of the peers may be reviewed and invalidated, and a new trial granted, so that practically a jury has no absolute power to take a party's goods, rights, or person. They have only an absolute veto upon their being taken by the government. The government is not bound to do everything that a jury may adjudge. It is only prohibited from doing anything, that is, from taking a party's goods, rights, or person, unless a jury have first adjudged it to be done. But it will perhaps be said that if an erroneous judgment of one jury should be reaffirmed by another on a new trial, it must then be executed. But Magna Carta does not command even this, although it might perhaps have been reasonably safe for it to have done so. For if two juries unanimously affirm the same thing, after all the light and aid that judges and lawyers can afford them, that fact probably furnishes as strong a presumption in favor of the correctness of their opinion as can ordinarily be obtained in favor of a judgment by any measures of practical character for the administration of justice. Still, there is nothing in Magna Carta that compels the execution of even a second judgment of a jury. The only injunction of Magna Carta upon the government as to what it shall do on this point is that it shall do justice and right, without sell, denial, or delay. But this leaves the government all power of determining what is justice and right, except that it shall not consider anything as justice and right, so far as to carry it into execution against the goods, rights, or person of a party, unless it be something which a jury have sanctioned. If the government had no alternative but to execute all judgments of a jury indiscriminately, the power of juries would unquestionably be dangerous, for there is no doubt that they may sometimes give hasty and erroneous judgments. But when it is considered that their judgments can be reviewed and new trials granted, this danger is, for all practical purposes, obviated. If it be said that juries may successively give erroneous judgments, and that new trials cannot be granted indefinitely, the answer is, that so far as Magna Carta is concerned, there is nothing to prevent the granting of new trials indefinitely, if the judgments of juries are contrary to justice and right. So that Magna Carta does not require any judgment whatever to be executed, so far as to take a party's goods, rights, or person thereon, unless it be concurred in by both court and jury. Nevertheless, we may, for the sake of the argument, suppose the existence of a practical, if not legal, necessity for executing some judgment or other, in cases where juries persist in disagreeing with the courts. In such cases, the principle of Magna Carta unquestionably is, that the uniform judgments of successive juries shall prevail over the opinion of the court. And the reason of this principle is obvious, viz., that it is the will of the country, and not the will of the court, or the government, that must determine what laws shall be established and enforced. 
that the concurrent judgment of successive juries, given in opposition to all the reasoning which judges and lawyers can offer to the contrary, must necessarily be presumed to be a truer exposition of the will of the country than are the opinions of the judges. But it may be said that, unless jurors submit to the control of the court in matters of law, they may disagree among themselves and never come to any judgment, and thus justice fell to be done. Such a case is perhaps possible, but, if possible, it can occur but rarely, because, although one jury may disagree, a succession of juries are not likely to disagree, that is, on matters of natural law or abstract justice. Note. Most disagreements of juries are on matters of fact, which are admitted to be within their province. We have little or no evidence of their disagreements on matters of natural justice. The disagreements of courts on matters of law afford little or no evidence that juries would also disagree on matters of law, that is, of justice, because the disagreements of courts are generally on matters of legislation, and not on those principles of abstract justice by which juries would be governed and in regard to which the minds of men are nearly unanimous. End footnote. If such a thing should occur, it would almost certainly be owing to the attempt of the court to mislead them. It is hardly possible that any other cause should be adequate to produce such an effect, because justice comes very near to being a self-evident principle. The mind perceives it almost intuitively. If, in addition to this, the court be uniformly on the side of justice, it is not a reasonable supposition that a succession of juries should disagree about it. If, therefore, a succession of juries do disagree on the law of any case, the presumption is not that justice fails of being done, but that injustice is prevented. That injustice which would be done if the opinion of the court were suffered to control the jury. For the sake of argument, however, it may be admitted to be possible that justice should sometimes fail of being done through the disagreements of jurors, notwithstanding all the light which judges and lawyers can throw upon the question in issue. If it be asked what provision the trial by jury makes for such cases, the answer is, it makes none, and justice must fail of being done from the want of its being made sufficiently intelligible. Under the trial by jury, justice can never be done, that is, by a judgment that shall take a party's goods, rights, or person, until that justice can be made intelligible or perceptible to the minds of all the jurors, or, at least, until it obtain the voluntary assent of all, an assent which ought not to be given until the justice itself shall become perceptible to all. The principles of the trial by jury, then, are these. First, that in criminal cases the accused is presumed innocent. Second, that in civil cases possession is presumptive proof of property, or, in other words, every man is presumed to be the rightful proprietor of what he has in his possession. Third, that these presumptions shall be overcome in a court of justice only by evidence, the sufficiency of which, and by law, the justice of which, are satisfactory to the understanding and consciences of all the jurors. These are the bases on which the trial by jury places the property, liberty, and rights of every individual. But someone will say, if these are the principles of the trial by jury, then it is plain that justice must often fail to be done. Admitting for the sake of argument that this may be true, the compensation for it is, that positive injustice will also often fail to be done, whereas otherwise it would be done frequently. The very precautions used to prevent injustice being done may often have the effect to prevent justice being done. But are we, therefore, to take no precautions against injustice? By no means all will agree. The question then arises, does the trial by jury, as here explained, involve such extreme and unnecessary precautions against injustice as to interpose unnecessary obstacles to the doing of justice? Men of different minds may very likely answer this question differently. 
according as they have more or less confidence in the wisdom and justice of the legislators, the integrity and independence of judges, and the intelligence of jurors. This much, however, may be said in favor of these precautions, viz., that the history of the past, as well as our constant present experience, prove how much injustice may, and certainly will, be done, systematically and continually, for the want of these precautions. That is, while the law is authoritatively made and expounded by legislators and judges. On the other hand, we have no such evidence of how much justice may fail to be done by reason of these precautions, that is, by reason of the law being left to the judgments and consciences of jurors. We can determine the former point, that is, how much positive injustice is done under the first of these two systems, because the system is in full operation, but we cannot determine how much justice would fail to be done under the latter system, because we have, in modern times, had no experience of the use of the precautions themselves. In ancient times, when these precautions were nominally in force, such was the tyranny of kings, and such the poverty, ignorance, and inability of concert and resistance on the part of the people, that the system had no full or fair operation. It, nevertheless, under all these disadvantages, impressed itself upon the understandings and embedded itself in the hearts of the people, so as no other system of civil liberty has ever done. But this view of the two systems compares only the injustice done, and the justice omitted to be done, in the individual cases adjudged, without looking beyond them. And some persons might, on first thought, argue that, if justice failed of being done under the one system, oftener than positive injustices were done under the other, the balance was in favor of the latter system. But such a weighing of the two systems against each other gives no true idea of their comparative merits or demerits. For, possibly, in this view alone, the balance would not be very great in favor of either. To compare, or rather to contrast the two, we must consider that, under the jury system, the failures to do justice would be only rare and exceptional cases, and would be owing either to the intrinsic difficulty of the questions, or to the fact that the parties had transacted their business in a manner unintelligible to the jury, and the effects would be confined to the individual or individuals interested in the particular suits. No permanent law would be established thereby destructive of the rights of the people in other like cases and the people at large would continue to enjoy all their natural rights as before. But under the other system, whenever an unjust law is enacted by the legislature, and the judge impose it upon the jury as authoritative, and they give a judgment in accordance therewith, the authority of the law is thereby established, and the whole people are thus brought under the yoke of that law. Because they then understand that the law will be enforced against them in future, if they presume to exercise their rights, or refuse to comply with the exactions of the law. In this manner, all unjust laws are established, and made operative against the rights of the people. The difference, then, between the two systems is this. Under the one system, a jury, at distant intervals, would, not enforce any positive injustice, but only, fail of enforcing justice, in a dark and difficult case, or in consequence of the parties not having transacted their business in a manner intelligible to a jury, and the plaintiff would thus fail of obtaining what was rightfully due him. And there the matter would end, for evil, though not for good, for thenceforth parties warned of the danger of losing their rights would be careful to transact their business in a more clear and intelligible manner. Under the other system, the system of legislative and judicial authority, positive injustice is not only done in every suit arising under unjust laws, that is, men's property, liberty, or lives are not only unjustly taken on those particular judgments, but the rights of the whole people are struck down by the authority of the laws thus enforced, and a wide-sweeping tyranny at once put in operation. 
but there is another ample and conclusive answer to the argument that justice would often fail to be done if jurors were allowed to be governed by their own consciences instead of the direction of the justices in matters of law that answer is this legitimate government can be formed only by the voluntary association of all who contribute to its support as a voluntary association it can have for its objects only those things in which the members of the association are all agreed if therefore there be any justice in regard to which all the parties of the government are not agreed the objects of the association do not extend to it Note. This is the principle of all voluntary associations whatsoever. No voluntary association was ever formed, and in the nature of things there never can be one formed, for the accomplishment of any objects except those in which all the parties to the association are agreed. Government, therefore, must be kept within these limits, or it is no longer a voluntary association of all who contribute to its support, but a mere tyranny established by part over the rest all or nearly all voluntary associations give to a majority or to some other portion of the members less than the whole the right to use some limited discretion as to the means to be used to accomplish the ends in view but the ends themselves to be accomplished are always precisely defined and are such as every member necessarily agrees to else he would not voluntarily join the association justice is the object of government and those who support the government must be agreed as to the justice to be executed by it or they cannot rightfully unite in maintaining the government itself End footnote. if any of the members wish more than this if they claim to have acquired a more extended knowledge of justice than is common to all and wish to have their pretended discoveries carried into effect in reference to themselves they must either form a separate association for that purpose or be content to wait until they can make their views intelligible to the people at large they cannot claim or expect the whole people shall practice the folly of taking on trust their pretended superior knowledge and of committing blindly into their hands all their own interests liberties and rights to be disposed of on principles the justness of which the people themselves cannot comprehend. A government of the whole, therefore, must necessarily confine itself to the administration of such principles of law as all the people who contribute to the support of the government can comprehend and see the justice of. And it can be confined within these limits only by allowing the jurors, who represent all the parties to the compact, to judge of the law and the justice of the law in all cases whatsoever and if any justice be left undone under these circumstances it is a justice for which the nature of the association does not provide which the association does not undertake to do and which as an association it is under no obligation to do the people at large the unlearned and common people have certainly an indisputable right to associate for the establishment and maintenance of such a government as they themselves see the justice of and feel the need of for the promotion of their own interests and the safety of their own rights without at the same time surrendering all their property liberty and rights into the hands of men who under the pretense of a superior and incomprehensible knowledge of justice may dispose of such property liberties and rights in a manner to suit their own selfish and dishonest purposes if a government were to be established and supported solely by that portion of the people who lay claim to superior knowledge there would be some consistency in their saying that the common people should not be received as jurors with power to judge of the justice of the laws but so long as the whole people or all the male adults are presumed to be voluntary parties to the government and voluntary contributors to its support there is no consistency in refusing to any one of them more than to another the right to sit as juror with full power to decide for himself whether any law that is proposed to be enforced in any particular case be within the objects of the association the conclusion therefore is that in a government form of voluntary association 
or on the theory of voluntary association, and voluntary support, as all the North American governments are, no law can rightfully be enforced by the association in its corporate capacity against the goods, rights, or person of any individual, except it be such as all the members of the association agree that it may enforce. To enforce any other law to the extent of taking a man's goods, rights, or person, would be making some of the parties to the association accomplices in what they regard as acts of injustice. It would also be making them consent to what they regard as the destruction of their own rights. These are things which no legitimate system or theory of government can require of any of the parties to do. The mode adopted by the trial by jury for ascertaining whether all the parties to the government do approve of a particular law is to take twelve men at random from the whole people, and accept their unanimous decision as representing the opinions of the whole. Even this mode is not theoretically accurate, for theoretical accuracy would require that every man who was a party to the government should individually give his consent to the enforcement of every law in every separate case, but such a thing would be impossible in practice. The consent of twelve men is therefore taken instead, with the privilege of appeal, and, in case of error found by the appeal court, a new trial, to guard against possible mistakes. This system, it is assumed, will ascertain the sense of the whole people, the country, with sufficient accuracy for all practical purposes, and with as much accuracy as is practicable without too great inconvenience and expense. End of chapter 5, part 1